Good morning and welcome to First Coleraine and to worship this Harvest Thanksgiving Sunday. If you're visiting with us, you are very, very welcome indeed. And I pray that God will richly bless you as you do that. Let us worship God together. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let's praise God for his goodness and grace and provision for us. Let's stand and sing all things bright and beautiful. a very good place to begin a harvest thanksgiving by remembering that God has made all things bright and beautiful. But then we remember what we have done with all things bright and beautiful. And we remember the situation in our world at this time and the result of our rebellion against God and against the good that he is doing. So let's turn and confess our sins. Heavenly Father, we sing these beautiful words and we thank you for every good gift that comes from your hand. But we are so aware, O oh Lord, of what we've done with all that you have provided. Israel and Gaza, Ukraine and Russia, Afghanistan, Burkina Faso, Colombia, Congo, Ethiopia, Iraq, Mali, Nigeria, Somalia, Somalia, South Sudan, Syria, the Yemen. Lord, everywhere we look in our world, we see the results of our greed and our hardness of heart and our selfishness and our bitterness and our anger and our violence. Father, forgive us. Thank you for being a God who speaks. A Father who delights to reveal yourself through your world and through your word. 
Forgive us for taking for granted all that you've created. We are so often thoughtless and thankless. And forgive us for taking for granted your written word. The Bible is such a gift to us, a trustworthy record of everything that is necessary for knowing you and loving you, worshiping you and serving you in this life and in the world that is to come. Thank you for how both creation and revelation point us to Jesus, the center and the focus of everything, the beginning and the end of your plan and your purpose. Every promise you've made finds its yes in Jesus. By him you created the world. Through Jesus you sustain all things. For Jesus everything is being kept as an inheritance. And through the gospel you have made us, even us, co-heirs with him. Father, you are merciful and kind and generous. Open our eyes to see Jesus is everything we need. To understand that he really does have the whole world in his hands. Upholding the universe. Enthroning and dethroning kings. Working in all things for our good and your glory. We bless and adore you for so measureless a salvation and so magnificent a saviour. In Jesus' tender name we pray. Amen. Let's respond to God's goodness and mercy and grace by singing together this lovely hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
let's continue to worship God. And Craig's going to come and read to us our uh, scripture reading this morning. We're studying the letter of James, and we're thinking about faith that works. And we've come to James chapter 2. Craig's going to come and read it for us. Craig, thank you. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a golden ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, your sin are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives free freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who is not being merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Greg, thank you so much indeed. Boys and girls, do you come down to the front? I'd like to come down and talk to you for a moment. Well, have you had a good week? Yes, good. Does anybody remember the story that you were thinking about last week in Adventures? Anybody remember the story? It was about a certain man who had to build something. Anybody remember what the story was about? Who was it? Please tell me. You, Noah. Noah. And do you remember Noah loved God? And so God said to him, Noah... The world has got so bad, I'm going to have to destroy everything and start again. And know what, you're going to rescue your family and every living thing. And he said, no, no, uh, God said to Noah, I'm going to ask you to build an ark. What was an ark? Anybody know it? Yeah. A, a big, big boat, a huge boat. And so, uh, remember, Noah didn't, didn't go this here. Do you remember? Remember, he actually listened to what God said and he began to do it. Now, here's the thing. Building an ark, how long do you think that took? Any thoughts? Any thoughts on how long it took to build the ark? An afternoon? Any ideas? A year? 50 years? <laughs> Honestly, we've no idea. We've no idea. But I tell you what, every single day, every single day, Noah got up in the morning, he had his breakfast, he brushed his teeth, and he went outside and he picked up his saw and he started to... Oh, Alan, I'm sorry. I've... Sorry, Alan. Let me just do a wee bit more for you. <laughs> he worked. He sawed and he got his hammer and he hammered the nails and he worked and he went home and he had his tea and he went to bed and he slept and he got up the next morning and he had his breakfast and he brushed his teeth and then he went out and he... <laughs> and he got his hammer and he hammered the nails and he went home and he had his tea and he went to bed. And the next morning he got up and he had his breakfast and he brushed his teeth. And he went out and he started to. And he hammered the nails. And then he went home and he had his tea. And he went to bed. And he got up the next morning and he had his breakfast. And he brushed his teeth. And he went out and he. Every single day it went on. And on, and on, and on, and on. I have no idea how many days that went on. But it takes a long, long time 
to build an ark. It takes a long time. You have to do it every day. There's no point in, in saying, oh, I'll, I'll saw today, but you know what? Maybe take a week off. Ah, sit down, do nothing. What happens when you do nothing? Does the ark get built? No, it doesn't. Let me show you something. I have this here. <laughs> Anybody know what that is? That's a flower. Anybody know what type of flower it is? That's a rose. Would a rose by any other name smell? Some of you know. Anybody know what this might be in this jug? Water. And you put a little bit of water on the rose. And I get up in the morning, I go to bed, I get up in the morning, I have my breakfast, I brush my teeth, teeth I take my little jug, and I water the flower. Bit bit. And then I go off and do my day's work, I come home, go to bed, get up in the morning, I have my breakfast, I brush my teeth, brush my teeth and then I water the flower. What would happen if for a week, I said to myself, oh, do you know what, couldn't be bothered. Couldn't be bothered watering my wee flower. What would happen, do you think? Huh, yeah, it would wilt. It would wilt. And all the leaves would start to fall off. And then the red rose, the petals would fall off. And the plant would die. Do you know what? It, it takes you to be, the, there's a big word, it's called faithful. Faithful. It means to be constant, to do something constantly, every, every day, never, never to, to miss, never to stop, to be faithful. You need to keep going day by day to build an ark. You need to keep going day by day to keep your little plant fresh. Actually, did you know, you need to brush your teeth every day. Not just once a week, or once a month, or once a year. It's no good. Your teeth will rot. Your teeth will rot. You have to keep doing it. Let me tell you something really important. Adventurers is so, so very important. And it's so very important that you're faithful and you come every week. We're learning the stories of the Bible week by week by week. And if you miss one week, you'll miss one story. If you miss... Two weeks, you'll miss two stories. If you miss three weeks, you'll miss three stories. And okay, so you might say, well, for a month, sure, it doesn't matter. But actually, just like the plant, just like the ark, if you want to grow, if you want to see results, then you need to be faithful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are faithful. The sun rises in the morning and it sets every evening. You are faithful to all of your promises. Thank you. Father, forgive us for the many times that we aren't faithful. We say one thing, but we do another. We set out with a good purpose, but then we give up. Father, help us to be faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. We're going to sing, and Emily's going to help us to sing a beautiful chorus called Mr. Noah built an ark. The people thought it's such a lark. Do you know what a lark is? What's a lark? Okay, it's a, it is a bird. But it's also a way of saying a joke. It's a bit of a joke. The people thought, that'll never happen. It's far too big a task. It'll never happen. But Noah, day by day, week by week, month by month, kept going. Let's all stand. Let's all stand on our feet. Let's go. Everybody on our feet. And let's sing. Boys and girls, on your feet. Let's sing. Mr. Noah built an ark. Let's do it.
turn to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. And let's pray and ask God to help us. Heavenly Father, thank you for your many gifts to us. We return to you today, O Lord, our gifts and offerings, and we pray that they might be a blessing, O Lord, to our community and to those who are in need. Thank you for the gift of your word, and we pray that you might give us, uh, O Lord, attentive minds and listening ears and hearts that by your word and spirit will be changed today, and that for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. At a very uh, young age, it dawned on me that my parents preferred my twin brother to me. When they asked me to blow up the balloons for his surprise birthday party, (laughs) it struck me. Have you ever felt that sting of favoritism? When they used to line up to choose the sports team, the football team or the hockey team. I remember I was always picked for left back, left back in the changing room. (laughs) Why do people play favorites? Why do we do that? Because people want to get on and people don't want to lose out. So they're partial. They they prefer those who will help them or whom they perceive will help them to get what they want. Favoritism. In families, it is so, so destructive. In the church, it is absolutely devastating. In the theme of hearing and doing that we're looking at in this section of uh, the letter of James, uh, listening to God but actually not doing what he tells us to do, James highlights the sin of favoritism that had gripped the church. He, He gives us yet another vivid example, an example of showing favoritism to the rich and despising the poor. But what he says applies equally to all types of such partiality, whether it's wealth or power or status or age or gender or background or anything else. I reckon this is very personal for James. Remember who's writing this? James, the brother of Jesus. He spent all of his growing up years and most of his adult days prejudging Jesus as a madman, as a fool, an embarrassment to the family. James preferred the rich and the powerful, the politicians and the Pharisees of his day. And he even went with his family to bring Jesus home one day. Do you remember that? But then James witnessed the resurrection. Jesus actually appeared to James. And he realized that the one he had been ashamed of, the one that he had despised, was actually the savior of the world. And James lived in a world where favoritism and prejudice, prejudging someone, was as natural as breathing. It was the very way that culture and every society worked in James's day. Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave and free, rich and poor, ruler and ruler, r- ruled. It was a very cruel and a very harsh and a very brutal and a very bloodthirsty and a very divided and a very dark world. The historian Tom Holland, who's not a Christian, Uh, wrote a book called Dominion. And and he writes that the more you live in the minds of the Romans, and I think even more the Greeks, the more alien they come to seem, the more frightening they come to seem. 
And what becomes most frightening really is a kind of quality of callousness that I think is terrifying because it is completely taken for granted. There's a kind of innocent quality about it. Nobody really questions it. Caesar is by some accounts slaughtering a million Gauls and enslaving a million others in the cause of boosting his political career. And far from fleeing away in embarrassment about it, he's promoting it. And when he holds his triumph, people are going through the streets of Rome carrying billboards boasting about how many people he's killed. This is really a terrifying alien world. And the more you look at it, the more you realize that it is built on systematic exploitation. In almost every way, this is a world that is unspeakably cruel to our way of thinking. And it has worried me more and more. But into that dark world came Christianity with a transforming force that swept across the globe. Christianity taught that men and women were created equal, made in the image of God, that every human being has intrinsic worth and value because of that. And that changed the world. But that that work, that change took time. It took time. It was something that the early church had to learn. It's called a work of sanctification, changing your heart. And And it takes time, day by day by day by day by day. In Exodus, it took one day for God to bring Israel out of Egypt, but it took 40 years for God to bring Egypt out of Israel. And so it was with the early church. The early Christians brought with them into the church the prejudice and the partiality and the the favoritism of the culture around them. And so do we. To favor someone And to disregard others based on outward factors is actually a terrible sin. And it has plagued the church since James' day. It plagues the church in every single generation. Now, if you were to think for a moment, we could all point to stories from the church's past where power and greed and wealth and influence have been more important than the gospel. And I have to say, it's embarrassing to say this as a church. Uh, If you go to some uh, older uh, Presbyterian church buildings, um, you'll find that you you walk in and there's a strange arrangement of pews. But then at the front of the church, there's kind of a box pew. You you remember, if you've ever seen those box pews, though, that dates back to the days when you had to pay for your pew. And so uh, the poor people, they got the the poor pews and the wealthy people at the front so they could be seen, got the big pews with the soft seats and maybe a cover over them and all sorts of stuff and maybe straw on the floor. We we were partial. We were showing favoritism. Some churches, it was the people in the gallery who were the poorest and the wealthy people sat downstairs. I don't think that's the case today. The sin of partiality. The fact that the gospel has survived at all, in spite of all of our failures, is testimony to its truth. The sin of partiality or prejudice has persisted in every generation. Sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it is blatant. Sometimes it's very subtle almost that you don't realize that it's happening. One theme of the church growth movement over the last three decades was based on the observation that certain people like to worship with their own kind. So some churches were planted with the aim of reaching certain segments of society. The church kind of borrowed from the sales world and from sales talk and from uh, the sales approach. We had something that we were marketing to the world. And so we had specific people groups that we were marketing that product to the church of the gospel. 
So churches were specifically aimed at appealing uh, to baby boomers or Generation Xers or a specific uh, uh, group or economic strata of, of society. And I'm sure that none of those churches, uh, those focused churches, would deliberately exclude those who didn't fit their targeted audience. But neither would they go out of their way to make such folks feel comfortable or welcome. It was about shaping the product, the church, to appeal to a niche audience. But no one ever stopped to ask, how does that sales approach fit with Colossians 3.11, which says that in the body of Christ there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. You see, the, the makeup of the church should baffle the world. Baffle the world. The world should not be able to explain how people of different cultures and different classes and different ages and different stages can come together and love one another in harmony. How, how is that even possible? Well, let me tell you how it's possible. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was living in a Christian community and a 92-year-old sat me down to explain to me how it worked in their Christian community. He said to me, James, we're, we're not based, we, we're not together because we are some kind of affinity group. We all like cycling or all, we all like football or we all like rugby or we all like something. It's not because we're an affinity group. He said, we're like an orchestra. When you are tuning an orchestra, you don't tune the trombones to the trumpets or the saxophones to the strings. You don't do that. He said, you get a tuning fork and you tune every instrument to the tuning fork. There's where we've been going wrong, folks. There's where we've been going wrong. You tune every instrument to the tuning fork. And because everyone is in tune with the tuning fork, everybody's in tune. And he says, we love Jesus. We love Jesus. And because we love Jesus, we love one another. Favoritism might seem like a small thing. But James makes it here in James chapter 2 a huge thing. Look what he ranks it with. He ranks it right up there with adultery and murder. Sin is sin, James says, and sin spoils, and sin spreads, and sin separates. Take, let's, let's go into the passage. That's been a long introduction. Let's just delve into a pass the passage for a moment or two. So if you have your Bible open, have a look at verses 8 and 9. We're going to look very quickly at three contrasts that James makes. Have a look at verses 8 and 9. The first contrast is between love and and partiality, or love and favoritism. In fact, the contrast between the two is so sharp that James says that love and favoritism cannot go together. They are incompatible. To love well is to be impartial. To be partial is to lack love, James says. A person who loves well will stand out unmistakably from a person who shows favoritism. The contrast couldn't be sharper. Look at verses 8 and 9. If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. What James calls the royal law, every requirement of God, the hundreds of commands given over hundreds of years in the Old and New Testaments is summed up in two commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. James says, genuine love for God and for others is the point of every one of God's commands. And do you see? James is saying, God, God didn't love you because you were rich. He didn't choose you because you were better looking than anyone else. 
He didn't choose you because you had good education and you'd go on in life. He didn't choose you because you were in any way better than anyone else. God says to Israel long ago, I didn't choose you because of your great numbers or because you were a better nation. I chose you because I chose you. I chose you because I loved you. He loved you because he loved you. Do you see the, 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 the contrast? We must do the same. Love and favoritism are opposites. Secondly, verses 10 and 11, do you see the contrast between sin and sinner? He's kind of ratcheting up things. Especially if you think favoritism is no big deal. James says favoritism is more than just an isolated sin. If loving God and loving others fulfills the entire law, then failing to do so by showing favoritism breaks the entire law. Look what he says, verse 10, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. I reckon James's readers uh, thought that they were doing okay. Spiritually, they were doing okay. In most aspects of the faith, they were doing okay. And perhaps they were. For that reason, their continued favoritism might not have seemed like a big thing. But James's main point here is that even if his readers had obeyed every other command that God had given perfectly, and they certainly hadn't, their failure to love by showing partiality made them guilty of breaking all of God's law. Let me pause for a moment. That's that's a crucial concept in Christianity. I'm not sure if you've come across that. God's laws are tied to his nature. They are descriptions. They are a revelation of who he is. So the issue is never whether we keep this rule or keep that rule, or whether we keep more rules than we break. Some people want to think about it that way. As long as I do, or keep all of these, but I, I, I break that one. Sure, that one doesn't matter. I've kept all of these ones. That's, that's anathema to what the Bible says. A single act of disobedience is a complete break from God's nature. And so you're guilty. James is trying to say, look, folks, there's no such thing as committing a sin apart from being a sinner. The Bible does not talk about us as basically good people who occasionally commit a few sins. Rather, the Bible says all mankind, every one of us, commits sin because we are sinners. It's a stark contrast. Thirdly, the contrast that he gives is between mercy and judgment. Do you see that in verses 12 and 13? This is perhaps the harshest of all of what James says here, but perhaps also the most helpful to us. Verse 12 says, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. Remember, James says, all of us will be judged. The only question is, on what basis are you going to be judged by God? God's word tells us that the basis of our judgment is tied entirely to the object of our deepest trust. It's quite simple. If our trust is in Jesus, we will be judged on the basis of Jesus' righteousness. God will look at us, but he will see Jesus. If our trust is in anything or anyone else, we will be based, we will be judged on the basis of our own unrighteousness. But how do you know then if your deepest trust is in Jesus? That's where this final contrast comes into play. For James, throughout this letter, a changed life 
is the only genuine proof of genuine faith. The only way that you can tell if you have genuine faith is by a changed life. Anyone can claim to have faith or to have some type of religious experience, but true faith is always accompanied by true heart change. And true heart change shapes our words and our actions, what we say and what we do. So James here says to these early Christians, show that your faith in Jesus is real. Speak and act like it. And in the context of favoritism, verse 13, he says, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. It's simple. If you withhold mercy from others, then you will have no ground on which to expect mercy from God. It's the story Jesus told of the servant who was forgiven much, you remember? Forgiven a great deal. And then goes out and somebody owed him a fiver. And he says, you're thrown in prison until the day that you can pay. And when the master finds out what the servant has done, he's furious. If we withhold mercy from others, then we have no ground on which to expect mercy from God. It's harsh, isn't it? It's difficult. This is where the rubber hits the road in the Christian life. In 1527, Martin Luther wrote a paper, and he called the paper, Whether One May Flee from a Deadly Plague. Whether One Can Flee from a Deadly Plague. In other words, can you excuse yourself from caring for your brothers and sisters because of the circumstances? Well, the answer is not simply a simple yes or no. But one thing Martin Luther says, don't be afraid to lose out. Don't be afraid to die. Martin Luther says, Satan, the devil, feeds fears of death and makes us shrink back from showing mercy. That's favoritism. That's favoritism. You shrink back from showing mercy to someone because you're afraid that getting involved with them might harm you or hurt you or hurt your future. But you seek to align yourself with those that you think are going to do a good turn for you or get you somewhere, get you to where you want to be. Luther says, it's why we generally don't care for the poor and the needy because we care too much about our earthly lives and our own health and our own wealth. I'm going to read to you what he says. Listen carefully. Here's what he wrote. The devil stirs up terrors of death so that we do not care for our neighbors as we should. So you should say to the devil, no, you shall not have the last word. If Christ shed his blood for me and died for me, why should I not expose myself to some small dangers for his sake and disregard this feeble plague? If you can terrorize, Christ can strengthen me. Strengthen me. If you can kill, Christ can give me life. If you can poison in your fang, if you've got poison in your fangs, Christ is far greater medicine for me. Should not Christ with his promises be more important to me than the devil with his threats. There's the question when it comes to favoritism. Who are we listening to? Who are we listening to? Let's pray together and Joe's going to come and lead us in our prayers this morning. As we come before God with our intercessions,
Some words from Psalm 65. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their corn, for so you have prepared it. Lord, as we thank you for your gracious provision for all our needs, we remember before you the many in your world who do not share our bounty. We pray this morning for people facing famine, particularly in Burkina Faso, in Mali, in Somalia, in South Sudan. We pray for those in areas suffering war and strife. And in particular this morning, we lift up to you the latest crisis in the Middle East and the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. We pray for areas battered in recent times by natural disasters. Morocco, devastated by, earth, devastated by earthquake. Libya, battered by Storm Daniel. And we pray this morning for organizations seeking to bring relief in the name of Christ. Praying particularly for Tear Fund, Christian Aid, Samaritan's Purse. And we ask that you, that you will move many people to make a practical response to their needs. We pray for those in our own community, in deep poverty and at their wit's end. We pray in particular for the work of the Oasis Centre for our brother David as he directs its work. We ask that you will move our hearts to respond today to the needs of the Oasis Food Bank. And we'd ask you to prosper the work of many other food banks around our community. We pray for our farming community in these difficult and challenging times. We bring before you the mental and physical health issues faced by our farmers, the business pressures they face, the animal health worries they fear. And we ask your blessing today on the ministry of our church's rural chaplain, the Reverend Kenny Hanna. Lord, we remember the challenge from the epistle of James to be a genuine, loving and inclusive fellowship. As we pray this day, show us how to respond to the challenges of a broken and hungry world and of a fractured community. And we ask all our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our crucified Saviour, our reigning Lord, and our returning Judge, in whose name we pray. Amen. Joe, thank you. Let's stand to sing, Creation Sings the Father's Song.
May the grace of the Lord Christ Jesus and the love of the Father above and the presence and the power of the Spirit of God go with us this day and forevermore. And the people of God said, Amen.